Buckle in, buckaroos. This ride gets wild. Last week, we watched Christopher Kluse and Dr. Max Baker Heitch struggle with discussing the sin based responses to the divine hiddenness problem without calling Asian people moral degenerates. Instead, they merely imply that that would have to be the case if these arguments were correct. Today, we pick up where we left off, watching our hosts struggle to claim that anyone that doesn't believe as they do to be somehow deficient while simultaneously noticing such people are concentrated in Asian countries, but failing to notice that those holding to their version of God predominantly happen to be white. Do you happen to think that they will reach the logical conclusion that their God prefers white people? Or the conclusion that their argument is that white people are morally superior for the most part? Let's have a chat. Thank you to all of you that gave me the big boost last week that took me over the 10,000 subscriber mark. There will be a celebration stream on August 31st at 3.30 Central Time. We pick up with our host, Christopher, having just asked Dr. Baker his response to pre-axial non-belief, non-belief in cultures that predate monotheistic or even polytheistic ideation. What I'm kind of trying to do is almost give a cost-benefit analysis for someone wanting to maintain the sin-based response to hiddenness. So, I'm, again, I'm not, well, as I said, I'm not committed to a universal sin-based response. I'm not committed to, de to denying that there are any non-resistant non-believers. Seems plausible to me that there are some. Cool. Dr. Baker does not deny my existence. But do I even fall in the camp of non-resistant non-belief? That would depend entirely on how you define the terms. What must one be non-resistant to in order to fall into this camp? I have been clear that I am non-resistant to the idea that a God could exist. However, I am resistant to the idea that the Christian God exists. Since Dr. Baker is a Christian, and since what we saw in Part 1, that presupposing his form of theism is part of the argument, my guess is that he would declare me to be resistant. I not only do not believe his form of God exists, I don't think his form of God is even logically coherent, and thus isn't possible. Are all who don't believe in your form of God, Dr. Baker, resistant non-believers? It would seem from your statement that the answer is no, but I'm uncertain as to what camp Dr. Baker would place me, or others like me, into. Something very much along the lines of what William Lane Craig does say um, in response to the question of the fate of the unevangelized. Um, so Craig it appeals to Molinism, this idea that God knows what we freely would have done in any possible situation that we could have been in, um, including situations we never have actually been in. Um, and Craig basically wants to say that God has so arranged the world that all of the people in the areas that outside of um, exposure to monotheism, or maybe even specifically Christian monotheism, He's so arranged the world that all of those people that fall outside of that zone um, were such that um, God knew that they would have freely rejected God if they had been exposed to that information. To which I would ask why God would make such people in the first place. If God already knows before he makes a person that if he makes that person, that person will be an unbeliever then the act of making that person determines that that person will be an unbeliever. The person cannot choose to be other than what the all-seeing God has not only foreseen, but determined by the act of creation. Under Molinism, God allegedly has middle knowledge. He chooses to blind himself to some of his knowledge in order to be able to create a man that has free will. However, if God is then arranging people he knows will be non-believers, into settings where they will have no opportunity to become believers because he knows prior to them existing that they will not be believers, then he has not in fact blinded himself to his own foreknowledge. 
This position destroys the entire problem it aims to solve. You've just destroyed free will. Worse, if God sends people to hell to be tortured for eternity for non-belief, how could a loving God create such a person? The loving thing to do would be to opt only to make believers. You could make the argument that God needed to put people in the part of history where he was completely unknown to mankind and he didn't want to lose any of the ones that he knew would be believers. You know, the the special ones, the chosen ones, the ones that he actually had some love for. So he had to put the unbelievers there. Okay, but now you've lost the sovereignty of your God. If there has to be a time where mankind has no knowledge of God, why is that? Who declared that to be the case? Why is this person or thing stronger than your God and forcing your God to make people in a time he isn't known in against his will? So while you are free to make this argument if you like, I don't see how you could do so without destroying your theology. I kind of register my uh, skepticism about that option as um, I don't, don't think that's all that promising. Okay, so despite the paper not finding the major theological issue I see, he does see his own argument as problematic. Will he ever get to anything that is his position? Does he even have a position? I mean, one thing is that it, it invokes Molinism, which is metaphysically controversial. Not to mention theologically as well, though I realize that Molinists don't see it that way, and I don't know if Dr. Baker is a Molinist or not. But it's just like the Calvinists that don't see the problem with saying that they are fine with their own kids being sent to hell for no reason other than it was God's choice, uh, the God that they allegedly love. While that isn't a contradiction or even an impossibility, they have sacrificed their humanity on the altar of their God. But the other thing is it, it requires us to believe what seems, I think, very counterintuitive, which is that every single human being who has never been exposed to theism or Christianity would have rejected that if they had been exposed to it. That only holds if your God isn't omnipotent, able to put the people he knows will be believers where he wants them. Is your God not omnipotent, Dr. Baker? It also requires you to think that your God knows who will be a believer before he creates a person, which is determinism. I don't think Dr. Baker is a determinist. Because this is the far greater theological problem, I question whether Dr. Baker has considered the theological aspects, or if he has limited himself to exploring the philosophical aspects. So then I, I, the other option I give is what's what you might call the de re move. So in general, um, we can think about um, describing a person's mental states in two ways. They, if we describe their mental states, their beliefs, de dicto, we're describing them in terms of how they represent their beliefs to themselves. So if we have a prehistoric human who worships um, the maker of the sun, um, let's say, but they that what they think the maker of the sun is like is very different from the god of monotheism. So um, de dicto, it would be wrong to say that they're worshipping God. But maybe we could say de re, they are worshipping God, because the maker of the sun is, in fact, the god of monotheism, if monotheism is true. Dr. Baker has created a new category, the non-believing believer. Under this theory, a person could be a believer despite not knowing God because they believe in the only form of God they know about. This would be the God that grades on a curve and says, close enough. To me, this is excusagism. All of us together have to stop using the term apologist and start calling these people what they are, excusagists. Why doesn't your God just reveal himself if he wants people to know he exists? When I want attention, I don't go hide in a corner and count all the people that might possibly know that atheists exist. No, I make YouTube videos. I don't think that you are solving the problem, Dr. Baker. Instead, you seem to be making excuses for how your God could want people to know him and not reveal himself and then hold people accountable for not knowing what he chose not to reveal. The problem is your God is supposed to be holding all the cards. He has the power and ability to accomplish anything he chooses. If people don't know about him, that's his choice. But to punish people for not knowing what he chose not to reveal is unjust, unloving, and generally inconsistent with the character you want your God to have. Maybe it's time to admit that reality doesn't fit with your theology. 
It isn't possible for a loving God with the ability to reveal himself and the desire to do so to fail to do so. Most believers argue that the revelation is there. You just can't see it, which also makes no sense. I think it's time to face up to the fact that the Christian God is logically impossible. Um, a bit like, um, suppose I, you know, or suppose that someone didn't know that Superman is, uh, is um, Clark Kent and um, they, they um, really um, admire Superman. Um, well, they, we can say de re, they admire Clark Kent, um, not de dicto, because they, that's not how they represent their own mental state to themselves, but de re, they, they do admire Clark Kent. So as long as you love God, that's close enough? Doesn't matter which God, provided you think whatever form of God you believe in is the ultimate, since your God is the ultimate, in your opinion. Pick a God and pray. Then any God one thinks to be the ultimate is de re a belief in your God? Does that still apply today? Are Muslims de re Christians? Are Hindus de re Christians? Would the fact that they know about the Christian God be sufficient to remove the de re pass that one gets for not knowing? What if the information they have about the Christian God is bad information? What if they were told that the Christian God was an inferior God? In that case, could they still get a de re belief in your God because they think that their God is the ultimate? And why is your God so concerned about what humans think about it? Is your God so insecure that he needs humans to fawn over his greatness? If he doesn't need that, why is it so important to him? Um, yeah, okay, maybe prehistoric humans didn't have this monotheistic concept of God that we do, but they, um, insofar as they um, had uh, concepts of things that in fact are identical with God, if God exists, and if they you know, have certain religious attitudes, as I suggested, the maker of the sun or the maker of the, the, the stars, um, the, the, the kind of ground of my existence, all of these kinds of descriptions are in fact um, descriptions that uh, are fulfilled by God if God exists. And so we could say that they, they, de re, they are um, having attitudes towards God. Um, or, you, or just, um, you, you might say that they implicitly worship and believe in God. Why is this important? If this God cares about what they think and what they think about it, why not just come right out and say it? What purpose is there in hiding from humanity and then forcing you to come up with excuses for why it isn't revealing itself? Is there a consequence to knowing or not knowing about this God? It is implied in the claim that this knowledge is essential, but I don't know which version of hell Dr. Baker believes in. I'm wondering why a loving God would make hell, knowing most of humanity will end up there, and then hide from humanity to ensure that result. Can a good God hide when his hiddenness will cause pain and suffering? Is your God an evil God? And then you mentioned a problem with this view, this move, uh, that I call the Liz Eagle objection. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> the objection from the, the lizard eagle. So you imagine that this person fe has fear toward the creator of the stars because, oh my gosh, Whoever created the stars must be so powerful, mm. kind of fear the power of that being, whatever it is. Oh, and by the way, I have a cultural story that tells me what that is. Namely, it is a gigantic being with the body of a lizard, head of an eagle, and a capricious temperament. And then you say, mm. could such an attitude credibly be construed as a day ray attitude of fear toward God? And you say that seems dubious. A sun god is close enough, but a lizard god is not. Why? Who made Dr. Baker the judge of what beliefs are close enough to his? Or will he claim to have some kind of insight into the thoughts of his god? Has his god revealed to him which beliefs get a pass? It would seem not, as Dr. Baker doesn't present any of his claims with that level of confidence. Rather, it seems he is guessing at what his god wants, desires, and requires, which I find a defeater to his entire argument. If the whole point is to say that God isn't hidden, but has sufficiently revealed himself to humanity such that humanity can have an intelligent understanding of it, and yet, in order to make his case, he has to guess at what his God wants and what his God accepts as being the believer club. 
If well-educated believers like Dr. Baker here have to guess at what his God wants, what hope is there for the rest of humanity that doesn't start with his level of privilege in being raised in these beliefs and being well-educated in them? If a PhD in philosophy from Oxford still leaves one guessing as to what God requires for a person to be a believer, no case can be made that your God is not hidden. Thank you, Dr. Baker, for affirming the divine hiddenness problem far better than I ever could. And this is really implausible, especially with people whose ontology, their kind of map of the world um, and their conceptualization of what the the being is that they have these attitudes of reverence or worship towards. If it's really different from how the god of monotheism is, then then it, it, he thinks it, it gets implausible to say that they really are worshipping the god of monotheism implicitly. So some forms of worship of other gods is acceptable, but not others. Is there a standard for what is acceptable? If your answer is the Bible, then nothing short of God is acceptable. So clearly the Bible is not your standard. I'm guessing you would say God sets the standard, but since we don't have any communication from this God about what that standard is, how are humans to know if they are doing it right? How do they know if they have the right priorities? I still think that the day Ray move kind of has traction there. I mean, mm. in a way, I would just say that's what the move is all about. You take this wild yeah. sort of description um, and then you have it under a different guise, mm -hmm. the same object under a different guise, and you don't recognize it. Yeah. But Im implicitly, you do still have the re requisite attitude. So God doesn't care so much about what you do or what you think as what attitude you have? Under that system, belief doesn't seem to be a factor for determining if one is a believer. John 3.16 should look something like this. If it's not belief but attitude, what's with all the Bible verses about belief? So it's true. If, if there's a Liz Eagle that they view as the creator of the stars, but they still fear the creator of the stars, um, then I, I think there's a sense in which they do fear God yeah. because God equals the creator of the stars. So, even lizard gods should be fine, and the flying spaghetti monster, or even pantheism? The only thing that doesn't seem to be allowed is atheism. Maybe I need to read, read the paper. Seriously? You didn't read the paper? I did. It isn't that long. It took me about an hour. On the other hand, I came away from it about where you are here. It's really hard to tell what Dr. Baker's position is. He explores the scholarship on the issues and the responses, but doesn't come down hard on any one side, very like what you see here. Could it be that there really is no good response to the divine hiddenness problem? But I would want to hear more about, like, at what point does it become so distant, yeah. the concept, that now we lose De Ray because it just seems like you might not even possess the requisite concept at all and still have the right belief about the res or the object. Indeed. Just how close does one's theology need to be close enough? And if there is a God that cares about what humans believe about it, why has this God not made that clear? It almost seems as if, I don't know, maybe this God is hiding? Mm. Um, so even though the Liz Eagle is weird and really doesn't map on, as you say, ontologically to the theistic, theistic God, uh, there's still enough there that um, I would say it, w it would map on yeah. to the cre creator of the stars. It's hooking on. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not set against that either. Cool. Lizard Eagle gods are fine. Anyone want to start the Lizard Eagle religion? Evidently, that's close enough to Christianity as to be acceptable to God, at least in the opinion of our hosts. Does the Christian God listen to these guys to decide what is close enough? If it was really the devil who was telling Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, but his, if his word God was, if the way that the reference of that word was fixed was the being who told me to sacrifice my son Isaac, um, you might think that there's a reference failure there because the devil is too different from the being that um, perhaps, yeah, that, that Abraham thought he was picking out with the term God. 
Um, but but I don't think the Liz Eagle case is anywhere near that extreme. So it's possible Abraham was talking to the devil when he was asked to sacrifice Isaac? Interesting thought. If that's what Abraham thought, then his sacrifice wouldn't be okay, as that's the wrong attitude. But if he knows that it was a good God that told him to do this, then what he did was the right thing to do. Then belief in God for the wrong reasons makes one an unsaved believer. And no belief but the right attitude makes one a saved unbeliever. This is a complicated theology. Are you sure this is Christianity? Does Jesus fit anywhere into this religion? That yeah. means the Liz Eagle is prone to make judgments and choose courses of action on the basis of emotion. And the God of theism, <clears throat> as Swinburne says, is, you know, fully, fully rational and fully free and isn't prone to whims of emotion in terms of making judgments about what's best. Um, are you sure you're talking about the Christian God? Didn't your God fly off the handle and nearly kill Moses until his wife threw a foreskin at him? Didn't your God get mad at people for worshiping the golden calf and would have killed all of them if Moses had not intervened on their behalf? Are you sure we're talking about the same God here? And therefore, the Liz Eagle is going to make choices in terms of creating the world, creating the stars, that... <clears throat> that the God of theism just wouldn't make. And so you have a fundamental difference in terms of divine action. And that's how religions are born. Chris, you are fully aware that the Liz Eagle is a made-up God, a God you just made up, and yet you are attributing thoughts and personality to it. Could it be that this is exactly what happened with the Christian God? Could it be that the writers of the Bible did exactly what you were doing here with the Liz Eagle? And that's how we ended up with Judaism, Islam, and Christianity? Because that's the, exactly the way I see it. All gods are made up by humans and have the thoughts, personalities, characteristics, and ideas attributed to them by the humans that made them up. Where I end up landing on that whole De Re move is to say the best version of it, I think, would be one that tries to identify our um, moral attitudes with, um, and try to kind of have the locus of de re um, belief or worship or whatever towards or indeed rejection of God, locating that in our moral attitudes. Um, mm. uh, and the, the reason for that was that I, um, I, I quite like Robert Adams' account of obligation. O obligations are, are fundamentally social. They're always owed to someone. Um, and if that's right, then... Um, yeah, it, it seemed like it might be a, a more promising avenue to say that um, if someone kind of begrudges their moral obligations, they could be plausibly seen as de re begrudging God, for example. Finally, we have Dr. Baker's position. What is most important is that humans have the correct attitudes that result in better interactions with other humans. I'm fine with that theology. But the religion that fits best with that theology is Satanism. That fits the tenets of the Satanic Temple far better than it does the tenets of Christianity. Christianity is all about worshiping God, loving God, serving God, even to the detriment of other people. Satanism is about our relationship with other people. Should we tell Dr. Baker that he appears, at least to me, to be a Satanist and not a Christian? Okay, yeah, that, that seems like a good avenue to explore further. Cool. Chris wants in on Satanism, too. Welcome, guys. What am I saying? I'm not a Satanist. But hey, if I was forced to pick a religion, that is the one that I would pick. The person who's trying to defend the sin-based response um, would need to make, if they want to, increase the plausibility of their view in the face of this worry about yeah, virtue parity um, or even superiority of, of non-theists compared with some theists. Insufficiency move where you basically say, well, merely having um, theistic belief is insufficient for genuine saving faith, if you like. And I think that, you know, that's very clearly affirmed um, in various places in the New Testament and later Christian tradition. 
Um, you know, you think about um, Jesus saying that various people will come to him and say, you know, Lord, Lord, we did all this stuff in your name. I'm confused. A minute ago, what was important was how humans interacted with other humans. Where does being saved even fit into this picture? Why would there be any need for salvation in such a system where we are looking at human interaction with each other? Salvation from what? By whom? For what purpose? But Jesus seems to imply that they are they 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 weren't real followers of, of his. For that to be the case, we need to change the theology again. Suddenly, how humans behave toward one another is no longer the ultimate. Are you sure you know what your ultimate is? Or do you need to sort out your priorities? Um, James says kind of, that you know, even the demons believe that God exists and shudder. But, you know, um, obviously demons are thoroughly opposed to God. Is that obvious? In the Old Testament, Satan was on God's counsel. He was the accuser. He was the one that challenged God about who was a real follower. He worked with God. He wasn't an enemy. He did God's bidding. Divine and then, and then is just so I understand, is the is the way this filters back is to say the oily televangelist is likely a non-believer? Well, uh, not a non-believer, but lacks genuine faith. Um, oh, they, that's, they, okay. So, and and they, But again, help me understand, and my audience might be wondering this too, because... All we need is belief that God exists for these accounts to start the relationship, as Schellenberg says. Yes, so, yeah. propositional belief that God exists is, um, well, let's grant for now that it's necessary for having a relationship with God, but it's not sufficient. Okay. It would seem the standard of what one needs to believe in order to please this God is so nebulous that it varies from person to person. No wonder Christians can't be consistent on what the standard is. There is no definable standard. Sure, the, the oily televangelist, let's grant that he does believe that God exists, but he doesn't have the right kind of attitudes of the heart, attitudes of the, the will and so on towards God, okay. um, such that he would count as having genuine faith, genuine saving faith, okay. if you like. And then if what pleases your God isn't a matter of what's in the Bible, it's a matter of what's reasonable, is that not evidence that your God isn't real? After all, if one arrives at the desires of God, which is what you have defined as saving faith, by going through a reasoning process in your head, then you save yourself by your right reasoning, and there is no God involved in the process. What's really weird is you have to reason that there is a God that saves you, and once you have arrived at that idea, then you are saved. Have you not determined what is your God and your God's values? Is it not you that has set the standard for what your God wants? When you are left to your own power of reasoning to discover who your God is, and you have to explore the ideas and thoughts of other humans to arrive at the most logical and reasonable result, how can you claim to have arrived at any truth about a God? You've arrived at your own conclusions based on your preferences or what you think a God should be. Does your God do anything? Does your God guide you, speak to you? I don't hear you mentioning anything that your God actually does. You don't mention prayer or hearing from your God. You occasionally refer to something in the Bible which you obviously believe, but you don't speak of it as if it were authoritative or a source for knowing about your God. Your reasoning power alone is all that matters, and all your God cares about is that you think the correct thoughts about it. If your God never does anything, why should anyone care what your God wants? And if your God is what you reason it to be, what makes you think that it is anything more than a figment of your imagination? You reasoned it into existence, and it exists only in your mind. Other believers believe similar things based on what they have reasoned, but since you discuss these ideas together, you end up with similar, although not identical, ideas. And yes, that gets you to the thousands of denominations of believers, all believing various things about your God. Does the evidence not clearly point to your God existing only in your heads? How would that apply to the atheist, the, the virtuous atheist? Uh, well, so this is why I think that um, one probably would need to go further than just the insufficiency move, because at this point, all you've managed to say is that we found an, a, a non-theist who's superior morally and epistemically um, to some theist, 
Um, but and we've we've denied that the theist there was a a, a genuine um, you know had genuine saving faith. Um, but what I basically say is that 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 still looks like it's going to leave you in a situation of having to say, well, gosh, like there there can't be very many people with genuine saving faith in the world at all. Yes, because not many people think like you do. And if thinking like you do is what the God in your head wants, then not many people would get there. And since you determine what your God wants, not many people would have access to your thoughts on God and thus can't arrive at what you have determined to be the ultimate correct priorities. Please consider the possibility that the reason your God is so well hidden is that he isn't real at all. There's nothing to find. If every time you find someone who looks like a, a, a really intellectually and morally virtuous um, non-believer, um, we have to say that all of the believers who are on a par with them are, are, are not, you know, don't really have a genuine saving faith. That looks like the, the circle of who has genuine saving faith is going to get shrunk very small indeed. That seems uh, problematic because even if you say, well, hell's going to be really populated, if assuming the class, classical view, um, and heaven, there's just going to be this small amount of people and hell's mm -hmm. going to be really populated. I mean, to some extent, there there is some scripture that backs that up. Finish that thought, Christopher. It means that your God creates people with the intent of saving only a scant few, and the rest were all predestined to hell. Even if it isn't predestination, if it is the reasoning ability of each person and the moral fiber that each is made up of, who determined that? According to your theology, your God did, which would mean that your God made people in hell to go to hell. Is your God an evil God? Have you arrived at ditheism, the belief that God could be evil or is an evil God? Interestingly enough, Dr. Baker Heitch had a debate with Alex O'Connor on this very topic. A link is in the description. A good God certainly could not do what you describe your God as doing. The bar is too high if you think about the, the most virtuous non-believer, and then everyone below that is just doesn't have genuine saving faith. Yeah. That would be okay. Cool. Then how do you how do you uh, so, patch yeah, that, that up, or what do you? Yeah, what I call the non necessity move, which might sound surprising mm -hmm. at, at first glance, but it's the the move of saying that well, propositional belief that God exists um, may not only uh, be insufficient for genuine saving faith, maybe it's not even necessary. Atheists of good moral fiber are saved as belief in God isn't necessary for one to be a believer. Being saved is about being a good person. If one is a good person, it is reckoned to them as faith, even though they have no faith at all. You might as well just throw out your Bibles at this point, as what is in there is just a bunch of crap. Throw out your Bible, throw out your Bible, immoral. Are drifting away. If you want to be saved, you need to listen to Dr. Baker, as it would seem that he and his fellow thinkers are the only ones that know the truth. Except he doesn't seem to know. All the caveats and well maybes and so forth tell us that his theology isn't set in stone, so to speak. The goalposts tend to shift. And I just want to shake the man and ask him why he thinks any of his nebulous claims are real at all. How does he not see that he is making this up as he goes along? If his God were actually real, he is so hidden that even the most devout cannot find him. Could there be any better affirmation of the divine hiddenness problem than this conversation? May not only uh, be insufficient for genuine saving faith, maybe it's not even necessary for saving faith. Maybe there can be mm. people who, and I, as a, maybe there could be people who merely hope that God exists. So hope is a much weaker attitude than full belief that God exists. And maybe you have no idea what is real, or maybe what you have just described isn't the moral theist, but yourself. You merely hope that God exists. You don't know, but you hope what you believe is true. Then I suggest that that would ease the problem quite substantially, because then you, you actually are in a position of being able to say that, well, the person that you 
um, encounter as being really intellectually virtuous and epistemically conscientious, who who is an, um, a theist, um, maybe um, they might turn out to have had genuine saving faith. Um, and even though that might come as a surprise to, to them. And where did this idea originate? In your head? Where is your God in this? Maybe also in your head? Either your God exists only in your head and isn't real, or your God is so well hidden even you cannot find him. And once again, divine hiddenness affirmed. Wow, yeah. And then, but you say the worry with that is then it looks like saving faith is compatible with outright disbelief. I basically say like there would be a harder and a softer version of that move. So the, the harder oh. version of that move or bolder, if you like, version of that move would be to say that, yeah, maybe even people who fully disbelieve, outright disbelieve that God exists could have genuine saving faith, you know, contrary to all of their explicit declarations of what they themselves think. Throw out your Bibles. The Bible writers didn't know what God wanted. They didn't get to the right reasoning. Dr. Baker, is there any basis for your theology other than it's what you think? The response to um, objection C about sin's spatio-temporal distribution, how, how might a proponent of the sin-based account sort of best respond to that one? I don't think it's an option for an, an Orthodox Christian theist to say that the inborn disposition to sin, uh, what you might call original sin. I don't think uh, it's open to an Orthodox Christian theist to say that that is present more strongly in some people or some groups of people than others. I think uh, Orthodox Christianity has always been clear that all human beings are um, born with this disposition to sin. And uh, it's, it's not the case that some people are more originally sinful than others. At this point, do you even care what Orthodox Christianity says? Your theology is so far from orthodoxy that you can hardly call yourself a member of the group. When you reject the most basic tenets of their faith, namely that it is your faith in their God that saves you, what does it matter what the Orthodox think about sin? Maybe their ideas on sin are just as wrong as their ideas about salvation. Also, if we couple this with what was said earlier that I covered in part one, that the distribution of people of faith tends to be regional, the conclusion would have to be that despite there being an equal propensity for sin at birth, people of color are less likely to develop the moral fiber needed for saving grace than white people. We're back at a racist proposition. Except in today's episode, we discovered that faith in his God isn't necessarily what one needs for salvation. Rather, it's just good moral fiber. So possibly the graphs on the distribution of faith are all wrong. After all, there are believers, and literally millions of them, that are unsaved, and unbelievers that have sufficient moral fiber that they are saved. The saved don't always know that they are saved, and the unsaved often don't know that they are unsaved, and thus no survey of who is a believer is of any value, especially since belief has nothing to do with salvation. Yeah, throw out orthodoxy, too. What I do suggest is that it, it seems open to the sin-based responder to hiddenness to appeal to so, what you might call social or cultural sin, um, where the idea would be that it's not just the actions of individuals, entire social structures, um, legal um, uh, policies, um, institutions, all of that kind of thing could also be um, kind of shaped in ways that go contrary to the things that God values. There certainly are societies, social structures, and laws that go contrary to what I value. Institutional slavery comes to mind, in which case I would put the ancient Jewish culture, as described in the Bible, in that boat, as one lacking in moral fiber and thus unsaved. So much for God's chosen people. And which... Um make people living in that society less likely to end up believing that God exists. What difference does it make if they believe that? You have defined that as irrelevant to salvation. Why does it matter at this point what people think about God? Oh wait, you also defined sin as failing to love the ultimate, and the ultimate is being God. Uh, one can love God by having good moral fiber and doing good things despite having no actual belief in God? So I guess one can love God without realizing it. But does belief even matter? And if so, why? 
it's relevant to go back to something we were saying earlier about um, splitting apart sin and culpability, which might sound a weird thing to do, but I actually think it does make sense, especially when we're talking about social or cultural sin, where it transcends just individual decisions and actions, um, could be part of the explanation for non-belief. And yet it's not the case that the individual who's caught up in that is culpable for being caught up in that web. So not only is unbelief not always unbelief, but sin is not always sin. God will turn a blind eye to the person caught up in sin because of their culture. I would ask, if a person is of strong, good moral fiber, should they not be able to rise up against their culture and stand up for what they believe in? This seems to me to be the salvation of the wishy-washy. If you go along with the evil practices of your culture because you don't have the backbone to stand up against it, God will say, close enough, you found it distasteful even though you participated in the sinful practices. How is this having the right priorities? How is this having the love of the ultimate? I find Dr. Baker's faith to be as slippery as mercury. Just when you think you have it, he throws you another exception. Does Dr. Baker even know what he believes? Eat Honey, Be Happy summed it up well with this comment in part one. I wonder if the thought ever crosses Dr. Max Baker Heinch's mind, I went through all that theology education and this is the best that I've got? Based responses could still be part of the conversation and could still form part of the explanation, um, even if one isn't claiming that they explain every instance of non-belief. This is kind of where, where you end, and I thought we'd bring it back to the yeah. hiddenness arguments. <laughs> so it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, th these responses that you've canvassed, at least so far, there's plausibility in them. There's plausibility in this? I missed it. Where was there anything even remotely plausible in any of this? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm inclined to think that Schellenberg is still going to have the more plausible response in, in terms of just saying, "Fine, I can grant you that um, sin, you know, can play more of an explanatory role than some people have thought." But I'm still going to maintain, you might say that, like it's it's just really plausible that at least one human being has ended up in a state of non-belief, and that and it wasn't their fault that they did so. But he does hold that the majority of unbelievers are at fault for their unbelief. But why? They have discussed that culturally, many never hear the gospel because it is the norm where they are raised. They have also mentioned the oily evangelist. These oily evangelists have megachurches. There are literally millions of children raised in the theology of the oily evangelist. And when they see through the falsity of the preaching, they end up with no reason to think any god exists. Thus, those raised in that culture would be equally lacking in culpability. Now, what about those raised in entirely unbelief? They also arrive at their unbelief through no fault of their own. Next are those raised in a culture of belief that you hold to be too far from orthodoxy to be considered genuine belief. How about those raised in the home of believers, but where that belief isn't practiced? Maybe they are C&E Christians, or maybe they are in the home of devout believers who are abusive and don't live by the faith they claim to have. And now I have described about 90% of the human population. None of them are culpable for their unbelief or their belief that doesn't get them to salvation. If humans aren't culpable for their sin because no God has revealed himself sufficiently that they have any real knowledge of him on which to base a claim that they have sinned in rejecting this God or they have no or insufficient knowledge of, then there is no punishment for sin. Well, what do you know? Dr. Baker really did solve the divine hiddenness problem. God knows he is hidden from humans who have no idea what it is he wants, so he doesn't hold them culpable for the sin of unbelief. Orthodox Christianity is just a bunch of crap. Live your life? Wait a minute. That makes me a believer. But a believer in what? Can I still be godless granny if I'm a believer? Let's see. I still don't have a God, so it looks like I'm good. I'm still godless. Whew, that was close. Live your life. 